Grace to you. This is a message whose depth has practically accompanied me since the beginning of my ministry almost 40 years ago. I think that the first time I preached it in Bosco in 1990 and internationally in 1992. I remember that I was in the office of uh, the pastor of a very big church in Sicily in Italy at the end of the service and the head of the bookshop ran in and said we've never sold so many videos before (laughs) isn't that interesting what a simple revelation received from the holy spirit can do to the hungry souls of believers who want to receive it who need who desire who hunger for such a revelation. So this will be a message revised and corrected clearly in the light of almost 30 more years of spiritual growth. But taken from that series of preaching that I made in the distant 90s. And the title of this message or the title of this series is The Little Big Words. Small, insignificant words that have a great, great, very great impact on the gospel of grace. Now John 1, 1, 2, and 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In Him, the Word was life. Oh, it seems that according to what the scripture states, the Word is rather important. And we can clearly see in this passage that the word is not a thing, but a person. It's a he, it's a him. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's identified as a person, not a thing. And we all know, or at least we should know, that according to what the Apostle Paul states in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, God has made us ministers able to speak about his new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. Since the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Oh, sadly, some Christians have made the Bible the third member of the Trinity. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Book. <laughs> Please remember that John 1.14 states rather clearly that the Word was made flesh, not paper. Now, the Word is a person, not a thing. The Word is Jesus Christ, and it comes out of His mouth, it comes out of His Spirit. It is the author of the Bible that we are interested in. It is not the written Word, the letter, that contains life, but the author of this written Word, the person of Jesus Christ, who pronounces words which 90% of the cases are found in the Bible, but which can also be found in a song, in a sermon, in a book, in a discussion among friends, in a message, or in a sunset. The voice of the divine shepherd that all of us should recognize and follow does not spit sentences, but speaks revelation. And that is why such revelation can be found in big words like justification, sanctification, righteousness, and apostasy, in important words like love, grace, peace, faith, but also in small words like but, in, not, and, if. Just as Jesus says in Matthew 4, 4, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word, small, big, important, long, short, or difficult, every word spoken by God and revealed to us by His Spirit is a container of life. Remember what uh, the Word said in John 1. He said, in Him was life. 
just as this jar contains jam or marmalade. God's Word is a container of life that only needs to be opened by revelation in order to be enjoyed. I can, I can, I can look at this thing. I can, I can, I can see it. I can, I can try to understand it. I can try, but in order to get the content of that, I have got to open it and eat it. Very nice, homemade. The same thing is with every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You have to open it by revelation and eat it and receive it and absorb it so that you can receive the life that is contained within that word. This is the letter. The letter doesn't serve any. In fact, this thing at the right speed could kill me. <laughs> But that which can that which is contained inside here, yeah, I'm gonna have a little bit more, uh, is uh, it's life. And life it's 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 marmalade. And marmalade gives me strength, gives me life, gives me gives me pleasure. And that's what the word does. You gotta open it, you gotta open, you gotta crack it open by revelation and enjoy it only then will the word become life to you otherwise it's just a letter that kills or in the case of matthew 4 4 that we just read the word jesus referred to was the word beloved and why was it so important what kind of life did this word contain well it's very simple the word beloved was conveniently left out by the devil you remember that in in Matthew uh, 3, uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus was uh, uh, being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And the word from heaven came and said, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And uh, in uh, in the beginning of, a cha- of chapter 4, we see that Jesus is, is, uh, is led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And the devil begins his temptations the same way that he did with Adam. And the same way that he does with you and with me every day. He says, you, you say you're the Son of God? You want to be like God? Well, prove it. Do something. With Adam, he told him, if you want to be like God, you need to do something. You need to eat this apple or this pear or the banana, whatever, whatever that was. Um, and uh, you've got to do something in order to be what you were. You remember the Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says to us that God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So Adam and Eve, as such, they were, ju- they were already like God because they, were, they had been made in his image according to his likeness. So they were already like God. But the devil comes and he says, what you have you don't really have. Don't trust God. Don't trust God when he says that you're born again. Don't trust God when he says that he has made you new. Don't trust God when he says that your spirit is perfectly clean, perfectly pure, perfectly righteous. Don't trust God. Do something in order to be what you already are. Of course, he doesn't say that. He says, do something in order to be what you desire to be, because you're not already that because God lied when he said, you you are made in my image according to my likeness. And so, uh, um, so Jesus goes to the to the to the desert to be uh, um, tempted of the devil, and the devil does the same thing that he did with Adam. He said, "If you are the Son of God, do something to prove it. Turn these stones into bread." Now we all know the stone, the stone, the the the, the, the stone as such is an image. You just, it's a shadow of the law. All right. Uh, even even Paul says in, in uh, to the Corinthians that uh, the ministry uh, of the uh, of the law written on tablets of stone, wh- what was that? The Ten Commandments is the ministry of death and condemnation. So once again, he reinstates the the fact that the the container, the word, the letter, as such, is nothing more, or the Torah in this case, the the law is nothing more than a ministry of death. Because it was designed to kill you. That's why you need the Savior. That's why you need grace. That's why you need, as, as a Jew, you need the Messiah. As a, as, a, as a Gentile, you need Jesus Christ. You need the Savior. So, he says, 
uh, the devil says to Jesus, what you came to do, um, um, what, um, if you are the son of God, do something to prove it, right? Turn the stones, turn the law into bread, which is bread is a shadow of life, so, which is exactly what Jesus had come to do. But does, he doesn't need to prove it. Because, why? Because God did it. So the devil says, if you are the son of God, prove it. Do what you came to do. But prove, do it in order to, to, to prove who you are, in order to prove your identity. And Jesus says what you and I should say every day to the devil when he does the same thing to us. I don't have to prove it. My Father in heaven said it. That settles it. I believe it. That's it. I don't have to prove I'm a son of God. The, the Bible says uh, in, in the letter of Galatians, in the letter to the Romans, all over the place, uh, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, um, and to those who received him, he gave the right to be called sons of God, to become sons of God. So the, the, the word, the word Jesus Christ says, I am a son. I don't have to prove it. I am a son. But what is the word that the devil very conveniently left out? It's the word beloved. And why did they do that? He did that because I can assure you that once you are certain that you are beloved, you, the, the temptation loses all its strength. The, the, the strength of the temptation is rooted in the fact that you don't believe that God loves you. If you believe that God loves you, if you believe that you are beloved son of God, the temptation loses all its strength. Because you know that in any case, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so the devil conveniently leaves the uh, uh, check. Uh, the, uh, God says, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And the devil says, if you are the son of God. He doesn't say, if you are the beloved son of God. He says, if you're the son of God, prove it. And Jesus said what? The phrase that we have uh, uh, mentioned at the beginning, he says, a man shall not live by bread alone. In other, in other words, man, man shall not live, live by, by life, physical life alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the life contained in every word that proceeds from, and he says in every word, small word, little word, important word, not important word, uh, big word, small word, whatever word is, when it proceeds from the mouth of God, I note, notice that he doesn't say that he's written in the book of the Bible or in the book of the Torah. No, he says that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the word that brings you life is the spoken word. That's why in John 10, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Doesn't say my sheep read my word in a book. Okay, also because, by the way, please understand that the Bible as such that the Bible only came into being in the late 1800s. It got first printed in the 1500s in Gutenberg. And uh, nobody, nobody had a copy. I mean, the people like you and me uh, uh, didn't have a copy. The church survived and thrived for 15, 16, 17 centuries without the book. There was no book. There was no open the Bible to look chapter 8. No, there was, there was no book. There was a message. There wasn't a book. There was a message. And that's why the message spread. Because Christians proved with their lives and with their love, with their patience, with their goodness, with their kindness, with their, with their, with their peace, proved that the message that they were carrying was real. Today we go around spitting out sentences of verses and and uh, scriptures and this and that and the other but but we don't we don't we don't transmit that presence of God that the people are so hungry for. Jesus didn't say go into the whole world and, and make testimony of my no he said then be my witnesses it, 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 Jesus didn't say do anything he said be something so be be just be uh, be a son of God, be a, a, an envoy of heaven, be a, an ambassador, be a messenger of good news. Don't tell me uh, about Jesus. Show me Jesus, because Jesus in you is the hope of glory. All right, but today I would like to talk to you about a little bit big word that I think is extremely important, and it's the word but. 
simple but beauty but defined by the dictionary as a conjunction used used to introduce a phrase or clause contrasting with what has already been mentioned right so now and we find it among other places in one of my favorite chapters ephesians chapter 2 it's one of my favorite chapters in the bible ephesians chapter 2 now let's first read the two verses where this little big word appears and then i want to read the first 10 verses of the second chapter of ephesians from my version of paul's letters interpreted in the light of grace and in the in modern vernacular called the announcement okay ephesians 2 4 and 5 it's a conjunction remember but it's a conjunction used to introduce a phrase or a clause contrasting with what has already been mentioned okay so Paul mentions something, we read it just now, but he says that we're a bunch of criminals, sinners. And then he says, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So notice that after he says that we're the uh, sons of disobedience, uh, the, uh, the wrath of God, and the, the, we were adulterers, and we were this, and we were that, and we were the other, we were a, we were a, a, total, a total catastrophe. Uh, all right. Then he says two words, but, the, the, the little big word, but, but God. Not but I, but he says, but, but God. What does it mean? It means that you were a mess. It doesn't say, but then you changed. No, <laughs> it says, but God. The, the initiative for salvation is God's, not mine. Okay? So it doesn't say, but then you repented. No. But then you uh, uh, changed uh, your way of doing things. Then you stopped pe- uh, sinning. But then you you made penance but then you understood and you went to god and you asked for forgiveness no it doesn't say any of that he says but god why because of his great love with which he loved us so you see there is nothing for me to do but receive just like john three sixteen says because god so loved the world that he didn't ask him to do anything he gave his only begotten son now if you want to participate in the blessings and in the benefits of such a gift such an incredible gift. All you have to do is believe it. For whosoever believes in him shall never perish by eternal life. So there you go. You go with the fact that the, the, this, is, this is a container of life. and you, you starve into death. And I offer you this container of life. That's why Paul says, by grace you have been saved. Uh, and you will see later on in 8 and 9. Where he says you have been saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. So God offers you this gift. But in order to partake of this gift, in order to benefit from this gift, you have to say thank you very much. You take it, you open it, and you eat from it. And that's exactly what the, what the cross did. The cross offers you salvation, but you need to say thank you very much, receive the word of the cross, receive the gospel, receive the good news of the death and resurrection of Christ and of the of the uh, inclusion of Mario Marchio, of whoever you are, in that death and resurrection and partake of the benefit of that faith, which is eternal life. Note, it's eternal life. It's not temporary life. God doesn't give you eternal life when you believe and take it back if you make a mistake, if you sin. <laughs> no, no. That's what the religionists say. That's nonsense. That's a, that's a life. No. The life is eternal. Once you believe, once you kick into that divine realm of eternity where God lives, nothing can ever change again. You're a son and you'll forever be a son. You're saved and you'll forever be saved. The life is eternal, is not temporary. Okay, now I want to read from uh, the same chapter, Ephesians 2, but I want to read from my version of the uh, letters of Paul written 
um, not translated because I, I, I cannot translate, but I can interpret. I can take the, the, the original texts, I, I can take uh, other versions, I can uh, draw them all together, and then I can hear the Holy Spirit talking to me. And through grace, through the, through the, the, the glasses of grace, see what the Holy Spirit wants to say in modern vernacular. Okay, here goes. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, from the version of the announcement. Paul tells the Ephesians, not so long ago, you were still trapped in the quicksand of sin. That old way of life you were used to. <laughs> Let the world tell me how to behave. Man, it's like, it's like asking a fish to teach you how to climb a tree. To ask the world to teach you how to live is not to ask a, a fish to teach you how to climb a tree. You filled your lungs with air infected with the spirit of disbelief and you just exhaled rebellion. We and you all in the same boat, stubborn, arrogant, damaged, all guilty alike. It was as if a perverse passion had given birth to a universal generation of deformed children. How sad. This is the position in which they were, right? But God, ah, what a wonderful duet of words. But God, but God had a very different plan for his creatures. Sin had left us dead in his presence, like so many spiritual corpses. Yet, even in the state of death and total incapacity, God wanted to revive us in Christ. Because of his great love for us, God saved us with his grace and seated us on the throne at his right hand in Christ. Verses 7 to 10. Imagine now the joy our creator feels in showering us with an abundance of grace and in demonstrating to all creation now and forever our inclusion in Christ, the generosity of the cross. The cross offers, faith receives. So simple. Our salvation was his idea and his initiative. All we have to do is believe it. Salvation is not a reward for good works. If so, we would probably go around bragging that we deserve it. No, we are his, sto his story. We are his poetry. Verse after verse, rhyme after rhyme. He is the writer. We are nothing but the empty pages that he fills with the plot he has created for us. I hope you followed on your traditional version so that you could see that I didn't go off the mark. But God, but God, not but I, but, but God. That's one of the most important keys to understanding grace. I hope I've been of some service to you. A big hug from Babo Mario. Bye.